Hello. Good morning. This is Zach Culver from the Kentucky Employee Assistance Program. And today we'll be talking about telecommuting and isolation risks uh, in that environment. Uh, why are we doing this? Um, this is not just because of COVID, but that was a catalyst. There have been a gradual shift to working from home that this pandemic has kicked into high gear. In many sectors of the economy, there has been increases in those employees working from home. Like other states, Kentucky state government has found it necessary to explore this as we reckon with the coronavirus. It'll be interesting to see what occurs when we get a vaccine and feel safer returning to work in full force after an extended period of telecommuting. Regardless, this is the reality for now, for many of us, for the foreseeable future, which is why this topic is important. And who knows what the landscape of work will look like for the next year and for the years to come. So loneliness seems to be a big problem worldwide. And in 2018, Britain appointed a minister of loneliness to address the issue because Great Britain is seeing a uh, significant uptick in those reporting issues related to being alone. In 2019, the American Cancer Society did a study analyzing data from more than 580,000 adults and found that social isolation increases the risk of premature death among white and African American participants. Broken down specifically among black participants, social isolation doubled the risk of early death, while it increased the risk among white participants by 60 to 84%. But this is not specific to Caucasians and African Americans. According to a survey done by Cigna, Hispanic respondents and those who identified their race as other are the loneliness, are the lon loneliest compared to other races. Last year, a Pew Research Center study of more than 6,000 US adults linked frequent loneliness to dissatisfaction with one's family, social, and community life. About 28% of those dissatisfied with their family feel lonely all or most of the time, compared with just 7% that are satisfied. Satisfaction with one's social life follows a similar pattern. 26% of those dissatisfied with their social lives are frequently lonely, compared with just 5% of those who rated themselves as satisfied. One in five Americans who say they are not satisfied with the quality of life in their local communities feel frequent loneliness, roughly triple the 7% of Americans who feel satisfied with the quality of life in their communities. So it's not a complete lack of these supports, but it's a dissatisfaction with the quality. And that is important to keep in mind as we move forward. Health-wise, the research really shows that the magnitude of risk presented by social isolation is very similar in magnitude to that of physical inactivity. Obviously, physical inactivity can lead to obesity. And we're seeing comparable physical risks in association with loneliness as those that are struggling with their weight. Additionally, we're seeing physical effects that mimic medical problems related to smoking 15 cigarettes or more a day. So as you can see, loneliness is a health crisis. That is indicating that loneliness can result in depression, which is probably easy to understand, but we're also finding that it's worsening feelings of anxiety. Consequently, loneliness has been found to raise levels of stress, which then can impede quality of sleep. Difficulty sleeping can have an impact on the efficiency with which our brain works, but there appear to have been more serious ramifications, and studies show a 40% increased risk for dementia for those suffering from loneliness. The American Cancer Society, which did the largest study to date, that we talked about earlier, shows a lot of particular harmful effects of loneliness. The previous research has provided other glimpses into effects of social isolation. A 2016 study 
uh, and Newcastle University linked loneliness to 30% increase in the risk of stroke or the development of coronary heart disease. Researchers note that a lonely individual's higher risk of ill health likely stems from several combined factors, behavioral, biological, and psychological. These are all dimensions that we're going to examine today. In findings published online by the proceedings at the National Academy of Sciences in the United States suggest that even brief social contact that does not involve a close emotional bond, such as small talk with a neighbor, could extend a person's life. Now, it's obviously important to have more intense connections with those in our social environment. But what I want to highlight is that these examples have more to do with interacting with someone in the flesh, even if it's just for a short period of time, because we're finding that makes all the difference. Psychoneuroimmunology, which is a mouthful, helps us understand the reasons for these medical issues. This field which examines the relationship between our brain and our immune system has blown up recently. And you've probably heard how problematic inflammation is to our body, but it's occurring for the wrong reason. It appears that the brain can set off this biological process when it's not necessary. Social safety theory hypothesizes that developing and maintaining friendly social bonds is a fundamental organizing principle of human behavior and that threats to social safety are a critical feature of psychological stressors that increase risk for disease. Central to this formulation is the fact that the human brain and immune system are principally designed to keep the body biologically safe using a fight or flight mechanism, which they do by continually monitoring and responding to social, physical, and microbial threats in the environment. Because situations involving social conflict Isolation, devaluation, rejection, and exclusion historically increased the risk for physical injury and infection. Cognitively, and the relationship with our immune system develops an anticipatory reaction to social threat. And these protective systems are very strong. This neurocognitive and immunological ability for humans to symbolically represent and respond to potentially dangerous social situations is ultimately critical for survival. When sustained, however, this multi-level biological threat response just increases risk for this severe inflammation that we discussed and the diseases that come from that. In 2015, there was a study done at the University of California, which provides us some additional clues to why loneliness can be harmful overall. This particular study examined gene expressions in leukocytes. And a leukocyte is a white blood cell that plays a key role in the immune system's response to infection. They found that the leukocyte of lonely participants, both humans and rhesus monkeys, showed an increased expression of genes involved in inflammation and a decreased expression of genes involved in antiviral responses. Loneliness, it seems, can lead to long-term fight or flight stress signals signaling, and this negatively affects our immune system functioning. So to put it simply, people who feel lonely have less immunity and more inflammation than people who don't. Now I mentioned these perceptions of threat scenarios. Obviously social conflict, well, social conflict is pretty straightforward. You know, getting in an argument with someone else causes stress, causes the fight or flight response, but that's not something as much we have to worry about when we're working from home and isolated from others. Isolation, that can cause some issues. Can't get more isolated than spending time away from the people that give you feedback, that allow you to know that you're doing a good job. Or feelings of devaluation, like the work that you're doing isn't appreciated by your management or your coworkers. There's rejection. Um, reaching out by email or instant message and not getting a response. And finally, exclusion, finding out there was a virtual meeting or some sort of instant messaging conversation that happened without your involvement. We have to be mindful of these as they are occurring. Don't feel that twinge of hurt or anger, but then not address it. That feeling is feedback. It's telling you that something needs to be done. We need to stop running from discomfort, accept 
that it's information, that it's guidance. Different types of mindfulness meditations can help us with that awareness. Keep has five guided meditations narrated by yours truly, available on our website under tips to managing your COVID anxiety. One of them is labeled sitting with your stress and can guide you through how to increase awareness of your body's feedback and then develop a plan for the most appropriate way to react to that information. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. I've included a link to these meditations in the resource section of the handouts that accompany this webinar. What we're finding, and as I look through all this information to prepare for this, uh, this webinar, loneliness seems to be an ongoing problem and something that's been an issue even before the pandemic. We're currently in the middle of doing the most recent census, but the previous one, the one 10 years ago, found that over 25% of the population live alone. That's the most in recorded history. And that equals around three, or that equals about 35 million people in the United States. Other trends that can add to the conversation are decreases in marriage rates, the number of children per household that have declined since the previous census. Now, as you may have already guessed, a good majority of folks living alone are age 65 and older but there also seems to be a general feeling of loneliness increasing through our society. Cygnus survey, which talked to 10,000 adults, found that 65% classified themselves as lonely. This is a 7% increase in just over two years when they surveyed folks for the first time in 2018. Further, younger generations seem to be lonelier than the older ones. Gen Zers, millennials, 79% and 71% respectively are lonely versus half of the boomers at 50%. Loneliness is an experience that has been around since the beginning of time and we all have to deal with it and can occur during life transitions such as the death of a loved one, a divorce, a move to a new city. This kind of loneliness is referred to by researchers as reactive loneliness. Problems can arise, however, when an experience of loneliness becomes chronic. Chronic loneliness is most likely to set in when individuals either don't have the emotional, mental, or financial resources to get out and satisfy their social needs, or they lack a social circle that can provide these benefits. This is when things can become very problematic and when many of the major negative health consequences of loneliness can set in. Relationship quality can affect health by influencing psychosocial factors such as mood, motivation, and coping skills. Friends and family members can be a big influence on a person's health-related behaviors, such as eating and exercise habits. And if we're not accessing those networks, then we're not getting that benefit. Like we already know, the quantity of our Facebook friends, those numbers are not what's beneficial. It's the substantive interactions you have with folks that are important. And I feel that the quickie likes and reposts are not meeting the need and the way of interacting might be turning into the norm. So here's the thing though, you've heard people say, I love my alone time. I myself being a therapist who speaks to others for a living, have to have the me time, or I get run down with the stress that comes from high levels of empathy, measuring my words, being aware of an individual's sensitivities. That type of deliberate distancing is not the same thing as loneliness. Isolating oneself can actually be very helpful and a good coping strategy when feeling overcome or if your social skill energy tank is on empty. The real sticking point here is to look at it in terms of choice. Being alone seems not to be a bad thing until you feel that it's being imposed on you. Either because you don't have an adequate social network due to a lack of emotional, mental, or financial resources. Of course, now even if you have the resources, you may be finding yourself alone because you're being required to isolate or, isolate or are isolating out of fear due to a worldwide health crisis. We are hardwired to be social. We need others to survive and found early on in our histories before industrialization that if we didn't hunt and live in groups, we more often than not died. There are dedicated areas of our brain that react to the interaction of others. Social bonding has been shown to reduce blood pressure and lower cortisol levels because 
that social connection triggers the release of oxytocin, which has been nauseatingly referred to as the cuddle hormone. Oxytocin has less to do with reproduction or intermittent reinforcement schedules, such as gambling, and more to do with connection and support, which helps us be healthier. I mention this because often people point to oxytocin um, as the, the chemical that represents love. But really, optimal levels of oxytocin help regulate cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone important to glucose metabolism and maintaining a healthy immune system. These optimal levels have been strongly linked to positive family relationships. This need for support starts early. Humans are capable of so much more than other creatures on this planet. But we start off more vulnerable than most other animals. Having an attachment to our caregivers is vital because we're just struggling to see and hold up our heads. So finding food and protecting ourselves is not an option alone. Getting close to a baby's face makes that connection because when things are clear for an infant, breastfeeding releases oxytocin, making soft noises and smiling are the same. We can't help to react positively to a smile because our brain is set up for that. The part of your brain that is responsible for your facial expression of smiling when happy or mimicking another smile resides in the singular cortex. This is an area that has to do with unconscious automatic responses. That's why smiling is contagious and it sets up a symbiotic relationship with the person you smile at because they struggle to suppress that automatic response. There was a study where subjects were shown pictures of several emotions, joy, anger, fear, and surprise. When the picture of someone smiling was presented, the researchers asked the subject to frown. Instead, they found that facial expressions went directly to imitation of what the subject saw. And that's good, because smiling releases feel-good neurotransmitters, dopamine, endorphins. This not only relaxes your body, but can also lower your heart rate and blood pressure. Children who experience social and emotional neglect are at a significantly higher risk for depression, anxiety, learning disabilities, all due to the stunning of growth in areas of the brain. Additionally, because of the lack of modeling of appropriate social and emotional reciprocity, that give and take that maintains relationships, there's a real deficit in empathy. And empathy seems to be a process that's in danger. Empathy is Latin for same suffering. Uh, by decreasing the ability to see others, we're decreasing the understanding that we're so much more alike than different. And that adds to this idea of in-group and out-group. The psychologist Stanley Milgram did a study in 1961, a pretty famous study, in which participants were put behind a fake control panel and told to shock another subject if they did not perform adequately. He showed that people were willing to shock someone at dangerous level if directed by an authority figure, and more people continued to up the power of the shock than those that refused. But these effects were reduced by altering the situation. When participants had another person in the room that would not participate, then obedience went down. Increasing the number of chances that someone will say no can have amazing effects on the rest of the group. It makes me think about these great photos during early days of the Louisville protest and those organizers who surrounded the one police officer that was separated from his unit in order to protect him. Interestingly enough, in the other versions of the Milgram experiment, if the person had to be directly in the room with the subject they were shocking, that direct exposure and seeing the person decreased the obedience rate. Think about that in terms of how nasty social discourse can be within media platforms. It's harder to trash someone to their face when you can't see their reaction. You know, when you can see, I'm sorry, when you can't see the reaction, when you can see their hurt, when you can see their anger, and you can feel it. Our brain's empathy systems have their share of problems. Most humans are generally good at empathizing with individuals, but we're not so good at trying to do the same for an entire nation or ethnic group. Some studies have demonstrated people especially fail if the large group embodies an ideology or cultural trait they disagree with. In fact, you might empathize well with your friends, but if you have particularly strong associations with your in-group, you will have de decreased empathy for those that you feel are not in your group. 
there are many examples of communication technologies that have the potential to destroy em empathy. Think about ideological information silos of broadcast, print, websites, social media, where only one side is represented and folks only listen, read, and watch their own thoughts. These media outlets not only work to destroy empathy, but actually move the needle of groups' acceptable actions to extremes. You know, what we're finding is that as soon as you demonize an outgroup, you've destroyed empathy. There's also too much information for us to take in. Mother Teresa was quoted as saying, if I look at the mass, I will never act. If our brains can't handle the barrage of emotionally draining stories told to us, we often negate or suppress the emotion. And that destroys our empathy because we feel too overwhelmed by it or we think we're going to be too overwhelmed by it. The natural response is to shut down our compassion because we are emotionally exhausted. A study at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, demonstrated how choosing whether to experience or suppress a strong and empathetic emotion can alter our empathetic feelings. However, if we are conscious of the diminishment in empathy, we can recover it. It's back to that notion of being deliberate, being aware. Researchers found that participants had a tendency to restrict empathy when exposed to a higher number of people suffering, that, those masses that Mother Teresa was talking about, because we predict that it would be too overwhelming. But actually, they found that it wasn't. When the participants are instructed to just sit with it and feel, they were successful. Now, obviously, pulling out individuals who may have triggering experiences with their own trauma, looking at those that do not have similar experiences to those that were suffering, these individuals were successful with providing, with experiencing empathy and not becoming overwhelmed by it. You know, avoidance of things we worry about drives us to find ways to distract ourselves, and that decreases our access to coping strategies that if we aren't using, we'll begin to wither away. And I don't just mean that metaphorically. Research has shown that the brain structures atrophy reduce in size when they're not being used or when they're flooded with stress hormones or you're having problems with mental health related issues. Reduction in size means a reduction in neurons, which are the circuits of our brain. There's no need to be resigned to reduce functioning, though, because our brains have an incredible capacity to bounce back. And we can grow neurons, a process referred to as neurogenesis, into our 70s and 80s if the brain is challenged adequately. What is the first step to challenging the brain? It's attention. Choosing to be aware of the internal processes of your mind so that we don't fall into those traps of group bias, and resulting discrimination are now allowing empathy to thrive because we were worried that it's hurt, gonna hurt us. How do we attend to others more effectively? We have to be deliberate and that becomes harder if you can't see the person, can't pick up on nonverbal cues, can't recognize when someone is affected by what we say and see the changes in emotions that we all share. When using social media or other one-sided communications, then the focus is on the message and often does not include the impact of that message. That is why now more than ever, the use of video to communicate as we distance is vital. There's been a rise in the number of autism diagnoses over the past 20 years, and the Center for Disease Control reports that the prevalence in autism has doubled over that span of time. There has been some concern that the quick increase in technologies that reduced the need for face-to-face -face contact over the past 40 years may be a factor. Now, there is no evidence to really support that theory, but we can take some interesting information from the population. People among the autism spectrum have often been miscategorized as lacking in empathy or not interested in relationships. In reality, many folks with this diagnosis experience a great deal of anxiety about relationships because they want them but struggle with the skills to build and maintain a social network and are in effect lonely. That lack of resources we discussed previously in addition to being excluded or isolated due to what others might seem odd behavior. Some of that behavior might be obvious avoidance of eye contact, a frequent observable behavior of those on the autism spectrum. That avoidance is not due to any type of disinterest, 
but it's often a way to manage anxiety or to better focus on the content of the conversation because the information provided by the nonverbal communication of the face can be overstimulating. And that's the part I want to continue to emphasize. We respond to visual cues, and they are an incredibly important part of communication and can significantly impact us on an unconscious level. So what happens when we can't see those we work with? Uncertainty, right? We keep hearing about that word in relation to the pandemic, uncertainty. It worms its way into our brain, especially without the nonverbal or direct feedback from our management or our coworkers. Our minds can be perpetual worst case scenario machines that get more prolific and louder the more alone we are. Many of us are being asked to write down everything that we we're doing when we we're working from home. And that has led many to, uh, people to have some significant distress, not because they're not working, but because they're evaluating whether they are working hard enough for their management or compared to others or ourselves the day before. We aren't machines and we definitely haven't been able to solve balancing work and personal life now that they overlap. So get some help, ask colleagues what they're doing that works. This is one of the reasons I sent out the email to folks to see what was working for them. And I'll share a few of those towards the end. In my 16 plus years of working at Keith, I get a large number of sighs, cross-eyed looks when I instruct employees to ask questions of their manager about more efficient ways of doing things or non-evaluation period assessments of their processes, of their progress. People are anxious about asking questions because they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to get that look that screams, don't you know how to do that? We've all gotten those looks at one time, but that's in the minority. Our brain, or more specifically our threat response, prioritizes memories that represent danger, like the social dangers I mentioned earlier, to the detriment of all the times that you were able to get the information you asked for. Research shows that people who ask questions are seen as more competent. Surveys of managers have indicated that leadership might be hesitant to put someone in charge that never asked questions because they could be seen as incapable of getting input or more prone to just compounding mistakes because they never asked for guidance. Let this time be a reset. Maybe being alone will help grease the social machine in your office, make communicating with those you find a challenge before seem a little bit more accessible. Take a breath, meditate, be mindful of your thoughts and where they show up in your body. Connect with the idea that we are all struggling in similar ways and that binds us more as humans than ever before. We tend to rally around distress. So sharing your struggles with colleagues can be affirming instead of sitting alone and beating yourself up for not handling things correctly. Get feedback from your boss that you're doing what you need to in order to quell that voice that might be telling you you aren't doing enough. And if you, even if you are told that you could be doing more, then at least you have information to work with. You know, take the opportunity to engage with your manager about your work. We are wrapping up on our midterm evaluations. Now that they are online, you have options for tracking progress, getting feedback. Start a dialogue with your manager on how they see job expectations looking and see how that lines up with your perceptions. If, you have, if you've been struggling with the communication in the past, contact us at Keep. We're happy to work with you on how to make that relationship more successful. Because often, there could be assumptions being made about your manager based off a few bad interactions. Ditto for those supervisors out there who might have staff pegged as difficult. We don't have to be as defensive or as suspicious or combative as the media is making the world out to be. So that's a good segue into this 2018 poll they did. Um, which 84% of Americans said that they were angrier today than a generation ago. 42% that they were anger, angrier in 2018 than in years prior. Um, and 90% said that they are more likely to express their anger on social media than in person. 29% said that news often made them angry. And this was all before COVID and the protests. So you can only imagine what we're thinking now but that can change if we want it to. Anger might feel justified, but it really feels good when the yelling dies down. Be the change that you want, that you wish to see in the world. Most of us have heard that quote from Mahatma Gandhi. It's so perfect in its simplicity, but in, it's in, in infinitely difficult in its execution. Because it's relying on the hope that if we put in the work, others will also. And then it's hard to take that leap of faith when we keep seeing everyone looking so angry and unapproachable. Anger is never the first response, 
but always a reaction to the anxiety that something of ours is being taken away. And in a world where it seems like resources are getting harder and harder to come by, that anxiety is real. However, it doesn't mean that we don't, it doesn't mean that we need to beat each other's throats. And tapping into that empathy we discussed is key. We can all identify with the fear that we might lose our financial security, our rights, our freedom, our lives. And that's what we can unite us instead of divide us. So technology can be helpful. How we use it is important. A study found that only five minutes of weekly video conferencing with families over a three month period of time alleviated depressive symptoms and loneliness for nursing home residents. And this is over a period of a year. In a similar study, researchers also found that video conference programs had a long term effect in alleviating depression symptoms and loneliness for elderly residents in nursing home settings. So beyond the year. The important thing and how they're used is building the quality of a social relationship, which is dependent on duration, and diversity of topics, and activities carried together. Time is important, because it facilitates the development of a collective shared history and identity. Intimacy develops through the participation in shared activities and discussions of diverse issues of personal concern. There's some great ways technology is being used in these types of ways. These Facebook groups where people are getting together for a particular reason. You know, book clubs, helping people in their community. Uh, Netflix parties where folks are getting together, watching a movie, commenting on it together while being apart. House party, which is a way to get on your smartphone or your computer and play trivia games with folks while you're distancing. I used to be involved in, in a lot of pub trivia, but can't go out anymore to the bars. So now pub trivia is being brought to me, which is pretty great. Some folks are um, doing presentations using Zoom. Everybody comes together and then everyone's separated into these Zoom breakout rooms for their teams where they can discuss the answers to the questions and then all come back. It's a really, really creative format in order to continue uh, this type of, of collective experience. Nextdoor is a wonderful app that connects people in the neighborhood. And you can find out those people that you know, may be elderly or medically fragile and figure out ways to help them um, get what they need during the scary time. If you're finding some of the other platforms online more stressful than supportive, if you're sick of um, Instagram and the fact that anybody can take a picture and post everything that they want all day long, even if it's a, a picture of a mistaken photo inside their pocket, um, check out Blip Photo. Blip Photo is neat because it's curated by the individual and they can only post one photo a day. So usually these photos have meaning to them or they're very artistic. Here's a few of my favorites that I've seen so far. Um, you know, it's, you're very deliberate about what it is that you're posting. And a lot of these things, um, the subject has to do with the small things in life. Um, at uh, artandhealing.org, there's this wonderful um, program called Stuck at Home Together. And this is using art and creativity to bring folks and connect folks. Uh, the website itself says, based on a growing body of scientific research, we know creative activities help to reduce anxiety while promoting meaningful connection, even when we can't be in the same room with each other. Our goal here is to offer a wide range of opportunities for engaging in creative expression, plus sharing and connecting with others. They have community check-ins, creative challenges, artist spotlights, and other great opportunities to connect. In the same artistic vein, a lot of um, really famous museums throughout the world are doing virtual museum tours that you can look at. Um, there are plenty of websites out there that just focus on good and positive news, and I've included all of these links um, within your handouts so you can access those as needed. Remember when we talked before about loneliness coming out of a lack of skills to increase our social networks? Then build those skills. You know, as a state government employee, being, you know, having access to my purpose gives you a lot of great opportunities, a few here that you see on the screen. 
building those skills that we need to have those types of reciprocal relationships, maintaining them, enriching them. I'm part of my research on this, seeing what was out there for folks. I also came upon something called Coursera and EDX. And this is free to low cost classes from really huge schools like Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, uh, all for free or low cost. That's about 13,000 courses from more than 900 universities available. Want to provide support, not use technology? Write a letter to somebody. You know, the Postal Service is having some difficulties financial wise. Um, my partner's sister started writing po postcards to her nephew. Um, he's five and working on reading. So she found cool postcards and research themed stamps and was writing him on a daily basis. She literally lives six miles away, but this gave her an opportunity to look for fun postcards, which are cheap uh, and provided my partner's son with stuff that he's motivated to try to read because it comes from his favorite aunt. Interesting thing is, is that the aunt um, started a stamp collection hobby uh, as part of doing this. You know, she found a new thing that she could do to pass her time. That's where real innovation and thinking comes from, you know, adversity. You know, we have these inspirational staff meetings and con you know, calls to innovation and the way that we do things, but this type of environment is where we're apt to find the most success. When things are hard, that's when creativity is motivated out of necessity. Here are some of my favorites, some postcards that I found online. Uh, if you don't understand this middle one, then congratulations, you're young. And finally, this last one, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. All right, so we kind of started talking about some very specific things you can do, but let's really get into it. Um, if I haven't made enough of an argument for the benefits of being able to communicate and connect visually, let's just drive it on home. We've got access to most of us as Sigur employees is access to Skype for Business, uh, Microsoft Teams. We can use this in order to see the folks that we need to communicate with visually. Make this a regular occurrence. It activates our neurochemistry as close as if being physically with a person. And you're getting those benefits of the nonverbal cues, higher doses of those neurotransmitters that keep us healthy. We're building a sense of connectedness and boosting that feeling of social safety. This also decreases misinterpretations of the quicker modes of communication that tend to be abrupt um, and minimal, resulting in a higher chance that folks, that folks are gonna slap their own insecurities on there. And even if you are writing more and communicating, tone and mood can be misinterpreted by the written word, unless that if you're talking to the person directly. My personnel cabinet colleague, Paula Chisholm, agrees. She writes, regular face-to-face -face meetings via Teams has been very helpful. She says, it's wonderful to see my coworkers smiling faces, and we could take a few minutes to catch up with each other's lives. The personal connection is important to all of us. Couldn't agree more. So if we're in a situation where the video options are not convenient, or the frequency is not an option, then at least prioritize phone conversations and do it often. You'll still get more information from the way someone is speaking, again, tone, mood, than you would through an email or an instant message or a text. Try to set designated spaces in your residence for work. Um, if you've ever taken part in my um, mindfulness meditation class, or any of the meditations that I uh, walk people through, I always tell them to sit in a position that's different from how you usually sit when you're relaxing or when you're, when you're working. That way, after multiple pairings, your brain begins to associate that position in space with the meditation practice itself. And often people report attaining their desire, desired meditative state a lot quicker. It's like it's priming your brain. The same goes for here, about setting up a workspace at home. Um, especially for those folks that are good about not bringing home their work. You're primed for other tasks when you're in your home, relaxing, hobbies, parenting, not doing work. 
So if you can bring something from your original workspace to your home, then do that to better set the stage. I have my coffee cup from work, and that's the first thing I put in my hands on the, in the, uh, every morning. I have my to-do folder ready to go. What's a to-do folder? Well, look out for my time management workshop later on in the year. To bring this point home, Jeremy Sapp from Frankfurt has worked hard to make home office space similar to work office space and goes on to say, I set dual screens on my laptop and a computer screen I have at home. I brought much of my office equipment to my home office so I have all my tools that I need. I create a designated section for my work and for my relaxing space, which is a tough one in a one bedroom apartment. I also have created a binder with all the procedural information I need in one place so I don't have to go in and out of the office. And that's fantastic, Jeremy. And, you know, way to make the best out of a, 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 of a difficult situation. You know, he stated that his uh, one bedroom apartment's not super big, but he's still figuring out a way to develop a workspace that can remind him of work, but then he's also separating from relaxing. Places to avoid when possible, the bed, because we associate that with sleep. The couch, we may associate that with TV or reading. Uh, the kitchen or the dining room table, because you might find yourself adding the COVID-19, as in 19 pounds, because you're associating that area with food. Now, if you can't avoid these spots, then change the setting. New tablecloth, sit in a different chair than you're used to. A quick note about eating, the usual you've heard about shopping for health is even more important now than ever, because we have more access to everything you buy when you're at home. Yeah, you can bring bad food to work, but never as much as in your fridge and in your cabinets. Did you know this existed? Well, I do. I just found out. Um, now I can enjoy two of my favorite things, chocolate ice cream and potato chips, all in one bite. And, you know, that, that easiness, that access is really problematic. Try to combat that by thinking about weaponizing your healthier food so it's easy to grab and go. Wash and prep your strawberries and your apples. Buy bananas or oranges. These are all high fiber fruits. Fiber helps you feel fuller longer. And as a nation, we need more of it in our diet. It helps with digestion, diabetes, cholesterol. Not a fruit fan? Then all carrots and cauliflower are high in fiber and can be prepped for grab and eat. You can get mixed nuts for protein. If you need a little sweet, toss in some M&Ms. Make smoothies with protein power to hold off your hunger or add avocado because it doesn't change the taste much and it's a big appetite suppressant. Freeze bananas and apples if they start to turn so they can be used in those smoothies. Just remember to keep your apples away from the other fruits and vegetables because they have a, a gas that when released makes everything else ripen faster in your fridge. Is your space in view of all your toys, TV, video games? Victorian fainting couch inside of your harp, inside of your harp library and provincial view of the countryside? Maybe that's just me. Then find a space away from that, preferably with a door. If that's not available, what about DIY walls? Ceiling hooks that are holding rope tied around a curtain rod can provide you with a divider. Finding yourself bored in your off time? Then buy a cheap white curtain and decorate it, making it an art project or a family project. My kids have a don't enter on fortnighting on their door. Why not have an adult version of that for ourselves? Get creative. A more elaborate idea is buy some PVC pipe and create a frame with feet that you fill with rocks to load it down and then sew some fabric in order to slide over the horizontal sides. Nice thing about that is you've got, if you've got a projector at home, you've just made a divider for the room and a movie screen for your backyard. Sometimes using an audio divider can be just as beneficial as a physical one. You can find wireless noise canceling headphones on Amazon for about $40. I'm real dependent on mine because my attentional powers are not what they used to be. And if other things are going on in the home, then I'm struggling to focus. Having music playing can provide companionship of sorts and helps a lot of folks get through the day, like Evelyn Mills from Frankfurt, who likes to listen to 80 stations. Or for those of you who can listen to spoken word while they're working podcasts, um, are also, they're wonderful tools to help engage the brain and fill your space with a voice of another person. Um, Tori Nelson in Louisville sings their praises. She says she's 
uh, a big podcast fan. I myself like them too. Some of my favorites are NPR's Hidden Brain. Um, yeah, that pairs really well with my field uh, of psychology. And then there's the TED Radio Hour, uh, which are the podcast version of those TED Talks, uh, those inspirational presentations that always spark my creativity. And Sherry Springgate from Georgetown is a fan of those as well. And she says she tries to get one in daily. Mainly though, I gravitate towards instrumental music. Um, spoken word, uh, talking, lyrics, things like that tend to distract me. Um, so usually I try to find something instrumental, whether it's something um, modern or maybe some classical. So just as the space you're working in primes you, so is what you wear. Uh, there was a study in which participants were told to, um, were put in a lab coat um, and they found that those that were physically wearing a lab coat increased their attention compared to not wearing the coat. They went on to do a few other experiments and they found that wearing the lab coat described as a doctor's coat when given to them increased, increased their sustained attention compared to the lab coat when it was described as a painter's coat. So this may benefit you as far as how you feel in that moment, being more focused, being more attentive, but it also will benefit you by how it influences those around you. I'm guilty myself of rolling out of bed and throwing on lounging clothes, but as I start researching this topic, as things started to worsen, I made an effort to wear something more business-like. Now I put on what Julie Brooks from Frankfurt um, hilariously referred to as hard clothes, quote unquote, um, every day. And something interesting happened and I recognized a, de uh, a, a pretty significant decrease in the number of interruptions from my kids. Now I'm not saying they completely stopped, but they definitely went down and there appeared to be um, a more thoughtfulness about the way they interrupted. You know, they didn't interrupt as much. They also kind of looked in to see if it was a good time to interrupt. You know, people respond to the presence you're displaying. So it can benefit you that way as well. Um, oops. Uh, I mentioned kids. So um, let's talk about that. Developing a family plan can be very, very important. There's nothing more isolating than being part, uh, being at home and your family seems to just be going about their business, not even acknowledging your presence presence or the fact that you're working. Um, I mean, talk about a feeling of being invisible. This is where the old tried and true family meeting comes into play. Start developing a plan with them on how they can be more respectful of your time and space. Uh, come up with symbols to indicate that you're, um, you're in a meeting and people need to be quiet. Uh, a sign on, on, on your door or your divider, like this caution adulting one, which I like. Um, I've heard people wear tiaras or different hats in order to let folks know uh, not to bother them. Uh, cut out uh, a, a picture of your face frowning and attach it to the back of your head. Again, get creative, but it's important to get family's input because if some of the ideas are theirs, then you get more buy-in and increase the chances of success. Use your break strategically. Um, you know, I have kind of an arrangement with my kids, you know, I'll work for a little bit then take my 15 minute breaks kind of check in with them, you know, make sure that my lunches, um, uh, I can do something with them and try to arrange it so that they're ready to go when I get, when I get that hour. Um, in fact, some of us even find playing with our kids relaxing. Andrew Calm, and for instance, from Covington, uh, attributes uh, his success at maintaining good health, uh, maintaining good health um, by playing with his kids on a regular basis. I like jumping on the Xbox with my boys as well when I have a minute. Uh, unfortunately, I usually get frustrated and feel old when they keep beating me. With screen time, we obviously have to get a little bit more lenient, but as far as video games, we just have to do the extra work on setting parental restrictions. You know, video games are worse when kids are playing by themselves because they become more immersed. So if they have the option of talking to their friends or playing online with their friends, then allow that. That's actually one of the things I've been thankful for is that my kids can connect with the other, especially when things were at their worst um, and they're not able to get together with, um, with the people that go to their support networks. But they can call them, they can play with them. Um, 
I just have my kids go through their clothes to see what fit and what fits and what doesn't. Um, you know, give your kids tasks on things to do. You know, um, younger kids might enjoy going to work like mom and dad. You can set, their, set them up with their own desk with papers and crayons and other things to mimic your workspace. Real little ones, um, you, you got to know their nap schedules, feeding schedules, plan around that. Um, that's in particular because that's maybe the time you can do more complicated tasks that require concentration and skills. Start charting your kids' ability to be on their own in a crib or playpen um, so you can plan more effectively. Okay. Motivation. You know, what makes you feel like you're having a productive day? Start by setting out some goals for your work first thing and loosely schedule them around already set up appointments or your kids' patterns or your own. If you don't know your own patterns, such as most attentive, um, most sleepy, most energized, most frustrated, then track it. You know, set a timer for every 30 minutes and quickly write down how you're feeling using these scales or some other descriptor that is important. You'll start seeing patterns that you can use when you flesh out your daily go goals. As I mentioned, look out for my time management workshop at the last quarter of the year or look up the great resources on my purpose or reach out to us at Keep about more time management strategies and how to implement them. I've also included in the handout some time tracker apps that look at workflow, but also look at bad habits. We've got to be mindful of being drawn to the news too often, especially if our anxiety is high. Not much is going on to change uh, in the way of knowing how to remain safe. All that information is there. And new information probably isn't great right now because it's about spikes, deaths. I'm not saying don't be informed, but you must be deliberate about how often you are looking and decrease it if it's taking up a lot of time or causing you distress. Ask your supports to keep you up to date if you're struggling to limit your time with the news. And this just helps to keep you in connection with those folks anyway by checking in with that person daily. Or use technology against technology. There's an online website extension called new feed eradicator and it blurs out news on Facebook feeds and replaces it with an inspirational quote of your choice. You know, there are ways to monitor and restrict your access to news apps and the internet that are often already built into your phone, especially if you have an iPhone or an Android. These also can be used for difficult um, difficulties disengaging from social media, which can be a real time suck and often increase our distress or an increased activation of our brain's reward system. To address this issue, look into the Facebook Demetricator, which uh, hides likes, comments, share numbers to keep you from fixating on that feedback and those reinforcement cycles. I've, linked to, uh, I've included a link to a great article in the handout talking about how to use these tools and other interesting ideas for how to use your phone but not let your phone use you. You know, these types of inter interventions slow you down, force awareness of that extra step which can make all the difference when you're breaking habits. So as we've seen, it takes a lot to stay on task and remain productive. So be kind to yourself and pledge that once your work is done and it's done, it's easier to do that when we physically leave work, but more of a challenge when we live at work. Close the door of your designated workspace if you can, like Audrey Terry from Frankfurt recommends. Don't let work creep happen where you find yourself working past time and get a thought about something and find yourself in your workspace wondering where the last 30 minutes went. If you've already developed a plan with the family, give them permission to keep you honest. My youngest has a habit now of yelling, he's doing it again, when I go past 430. If you've got no one to call you on it, then you need a way to symbolize the end of the day. Usually we drive home. Jessica Elliott from Louisville referenced that in her email about how that was helpful in order to switch over. So go get in your car and take a ride. You know, either put on a favorite song and get out or go somewhere for a walk. You know, someplace where you can social distance. Did you know that exercise is now an approved treatment for mild to moderate depression according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration? Kelly Scott from Louisville likes to take walks on breaks and lunches. Studies show a brisk 30 minutes three times a week does wonders for mood. Um, I had to stop going to the gym, which is a, a, a pretty big adjustment for me. Um, so I had to start doing, you know, I had to pivot. I had to start doing more aerobics, um, did more running, walking, making my kids move. Um, I ordered a pull-up bar about a month into all this, and then I had to order it two more times before I actually got it because everyone had the same idea. 
apparently they kept running out of stock. So I had this image of a bus guy doing pull-ups suspended over a bin of toilet paper while dry pasta cooked on the stove. Or have you seen this woman? This is the this is a lady that mistakenly bought 2,300 rolls of toilet paper by mistake because she clicked on the wrong thing. Um, there are lots of good websites with workouts you can um, do using your own body weight and things around the house, like an empty milk jug. I've linked to one in the handout. Uh, a lot of the videos have people outside. So we're made to move and ignoring that is, is, is important. Uh, Ray Clark in Frankfurt agrees and he says he likes to move around for five minutes every hour to keep the blood flowing and for constant exercise. Shelly Venable from Louisville has been meditating on breaks with free guided ones online and plans to keep doing even after returning to the office. I couldn't agree more. I've been meditating myself for over six years. Much of our negative thinking is not anchored in the present, but instead is rumination about past mistakes or future problems. Meditation can be a wonderful way to connect with the present, helping to filter out that self-critical voice, constantly doing color commentary about your life. Meditation has shown to help increase focus, improve emotional regulation, and increase awareness of our signs that we're stressed so that we can take steps in order to mitigate more serious effects. And I point you to the, the ones that we recorded and, and posted on our website. Um, there's lots of good apps. Um, and I've also included a reference to a book that's cheap on Amazon that walks you through many different types of meditations and why you should be using them called The Little Book of Being. I'm a fan because each chapter is only a few pages. It's pretty easily digestible. Great for someone new to the practice. Sleep. Try to get your seven to eight hours when you can. You gotta be careful of that late night fuzzy math when you're trying to finish out your binge of a particular TV show and you say to yourself, well, well it only says 48 minutes to go. Uh, and I only have to get to bed at 7.55, so blah, blah, blah. Well, there's still commercials on Hulu. You know, if you're looking through there, the same three they play over and over again and make you wanna jam the Amazon Fire Stick into your eye socket. Um, don't forget, you have to still get up, brush your teeth, get into bed, fall asleep. You know, start a bedtime routine if you haven't already, just as you should about everything else during this time. And don't remember, don't work from bed. If your job is stressful, then you start associating stress with your bed, and it's going to be harder to get to sleep. Um, there's a great webinar my colleague Sue Gaffield does on, on sleep habits, um, and she's presenting that uh, on August the 4th. You know, it may be hard to make these alterations if we're feeling down about anything, everything. I do private practice work on the side. A lot of my clients have been improving their moods lately um, until the realization that our summers are almost over and we have to keep being vigilant. You know, anxiety is through the roof and being alone with our thoughts can be torturous. So you have to be aware that you're having those thoughts and take steps to change the narrative. You know, if you feel agitated, you can meditate. Um, uh, if that's not helping or you're not feeling more focused or not calm, um, that's okay. Just have some more awareness of what's going on. Um, if you don't feel grounded, that tells you you need to work a little harder to change your thinking. You know, when we look at people suffering from depression, we see a pattern of belief that's stable, global, and internal. In, turn or, in terms of our current situation, stable, the situation's not going to change. No, it, it'll change. That's the thing about life. Everything is always changing. Sometimes it's for the worse, as we've seen of late, but often it gets better. And it will get better when the vaccine is developed. I know that a lot of you are thinking that we'll never get back to normal. And that might be true, but think about all we've adjusted to. Airport security. Quickly evolving technology. The Kardashians. Acceptance of our situation helps to foster adaptation, and that's the key to resilience. You know, look at all the clever ways people are doing, you know, people are being, uh, doing stuff with mask wearing. You know, are you a Rolling Stones fan? Well, there you go. Your 19th nervous breakdown. Um, this one just makes my head hurt. Global. Um, awfulness is everywhere, you know. This is where we really need to talk about acceptance. There's no real changing in thinking here, right? This global... This is a global pandemic. So of course it's a global way of seeing things. It seems to be everywhere. You know, we've already talked about the increases in loneliness and aggression. There's no way to sugarcoat this one, but this is a good opportunity to flex those empathy and compassion skills by reaching out to make sure others are doing well and being the change Gandhi refer referred to. 
you know, an interesting factoid that popped up when researching the data on loneliness was the rate of volunteerism has gone down. You know, it's understandable given high stress levels and personal challenges, but there's a growing body of research showing how beneficial giving can be to our brains and our health. Compassion therapy is a burgeoning approach that uses compassion for self and others to relieve intrusive feelings of shame and self-criticism. One of the most direct ways to enhance this is through working to help relieve the suffering of others. You know, the, uh, the elderly and those with compromised immune systems are at most risk um, during the coronavirus. You know, developing a social media group on how to help the elderly in your neighborhood. You know, uh, there was a, a program called Shopping Angel developed by a pre-med student going to the University of Nevada in which she got 20 members of her medical sorority to deliver food to the elderly in the area. She now has her own Facebook group page. Um, you know, there's an article talking about ideas that I've linked in your handout and website that shows volunteer opportunities that are all virtual. You know, using things uh, in order to help those, but also stay distant, physically distant, stay protected. You know, or reach out to family that's isolated if you're, if you're struggling to do some of these other things. Um, again, Zoom meetings, Skype, connect to those visually. And then finally, internal. Depressed folks tend to think everything is bad because of them. Obviously, no one's going to blame themselves for the outbreak. Worries about being the one to get it and spread it or abound. Getting tested can be helpful in this situation because it's actually information that's real. I had it done, and I'll admit it wasn't comfortable, but it was tolerable. And I can feel better about helping out my 94-year-old grandmother that relies on me for groceries and other needs. Wearing the mask, keeping physically distant, cleaning as you go, and using sanitizer and Clorox wipes like they're going out of style, as one of our audience members commented on. It gives you a sense of control in the midst of this. I agree it's a small sense, but still something to hold on to. And it doesn't hurt for us to be more mindful of how to keep ourselves healthy by following many of the tips for hand washing and self-care and face touching. Keep following those guidelines set by our governor and the medical community so that you can reduce the worry that you might be spreading it. Those of you that are in a leadership role, you know, a lot of the stuff we already talked about can be relevant to the way that you lead. Um, in particular, that constant communication, that connectivity, you know, make time for FaceTime. You know, use all that software out there. And if you're not familiar with it, then ask around to get that training. You know, have that little green dot available. Um, have it pop up so folks know that you're, you're available to talk to and to, to um, um, drop in on virtually. You know, make sure you're still calling out personal, important personal milestones like birthdays and work anniversaries, things like that. Um, send out virtual cards, have everybody on your team sign it. Have a virtual happy hour or lunch. Um, you know, make sure that your staff are not being isolated. Uh, Kim Claiborne in Paducah has really taken this idea of reaching out to her team and blown it up. You know, she noticed, she, she, she wrote to me and noticed that working from home was bothering some folks. So each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, she sends a motivational meme message out. Um, she's gone to the Dollar General store and picked up a blank of, a pack of blank cards and um, mailed staff a card with a napkin saying, life needs more happy days and happy hours and attached a lemonade packet to it. I love it. Um, you know, she feels that, she says that she feels that sharing happiness helps to make my day not seem so long and lonely. Set clear expectations for staff so they know what, um, you know, what is expected of them. There isn't that concern that they're not doing it right or they're not getting enough communication feedback. You know, you can trust your staff that they're doing what they need to do but be vigilant, right? You know, trust until you have a, a reason not to. That's why setting good expectations, very specific expectations, is necessary because you can use that as a guide to figure out if someone's straying, if someone's struggling, and make sure that you, you know, reduce the stigma of asking for help because a lot of folks are really struggling to adjust to this new situation. Be aware of the ways of communicating that are convenient or quick because those increase risk for misinterpretation for not getting enough information. And of course, model good behavior. 
you know, set the stage for what your folks should be doing. Um, you know, make sure that your workspace looks good when, when you have those virtual meetings, those visual meetings. Make sure that you're dressing the part. Um, talking about what seems to be working for you in this new environment. And always feel free, you know, I'm just kind of covering this in a quick sense um, and, and talking about a few key points, but employee assistance is for all state government employees, not just first line workers. We're looking for everybody. So supervisors that, you know, have questions about managing their team remotely, please give us a call. We're happy to have those conversations to address concerns and to give you ideas and have this communication uh, further on. And, you know, sunlight and outside can be so beneficial for folks, you know, get out when you can, just do it safely, right? Um, I love these shirts. This is a, a shirt from uh, a website called Moonshot Tees. Um, you know, drive by birthday parties, um, backyard gatherings of 10 and under, and if your space is big enough to social distance, bring your own, you know, BYOE, bring your own everything. That way you're not sharing foods. You know, set up garbage cans, people can throw their stuff away on the way out. Make sure you've got enough space to stay distant, but you can still communicate. But keep those gatherings low. You know, camping is a good way to go and get out um, and still enjoy nature, but stay away from others. Um, you know, go walk that dog. You know, my dog Levi is the trimmest he's ever been. Um, uh, it's funny because he used to lose his mind and snort and spin when I got off the leash, but now he just gets this tired look. You know, it's that kind of look that says, uh, please don't take me out again. I'm exhausted. Um, you know, the thing that I'm grateful for, I'm a, I'm a big sci-fi nerd, so I'm just grateful I have my very own Ewok at home, right? And Christina Bonassi from Frankfurt has been looking for roadside attractions. She talks about obscure places and looking for locations in Kentucky that, that are, are people free that you can visit on weekends. She talks about like graveyards and the Octagon House in Franklin County, Guntown Mountain and Cave City, Bell Tavern and Park City, um, uh, Fork in the Middle of the Road in Frankfurt, uh, Wigwam Village in Cave City, Waveland in Lexington, um, Switzer Bridge in Frankfurt, uh, Daniel Boone's last cabin in Carlisle. Um, you know, lots of great places that apparently she's already gone to or plans on going to. And she finishes off by saying that finding places where we can go and social distance has been very important. And I couldn't agree more. Contact us at employee assistance if you're struggling. Contact us if you want to talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the stuff that we talked about today and how to implement it. Um, you know, we've worked real hard to, you know, get out there, have these types of workshops so that people are, are reminded that we're a service for you, a supportive service. And now we have the option of virtual appointments. You know, you can call us and uh, like, like most people are used to by phone, or you can contact us by email or give us a call and set up a virtual appointment. Um, and we will send you the link. It's a third party confidential platform that allows you to be able to um, speak with us about what's going on. And we can see you face to face. And it's a great resource to have because this, this visual component is there. And so please, you know, give us a, give us a call, contact us. Someone's in the office Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 4.30, and we're here to provide support for you. I always tell people don't go out of your, you know, don't go out of your way to think too hard whether or not it's an appropriate phone call. Call us. You don't have to be really struggling in order to give us a call and reach out. You know, we're happy just to have conversations. You know, we want to catch you before things get real bad. Um, and if you just need somebody to vent to, we're happy to do that as well. So give us a call. All right. Thank you for all the attention. Um, and stay safe out there.